According to Plato, somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, just beyond the Pillars of Hercules, was an island that was home to a rich and glorious empire. An island paradise where a highly advanced civilization once lived. An island that one day sank into the ocean and vanished without a trace. Ever since the story of this island first emerged, people have tried to either figure out what the story represents or if there really was an island known as Atlantis. It's safe to say that Atlantis is one of, if not the most famous legendary place or places, and it has remained one of the most enduring myths from ancient times. The tale of Atlantis comes from the Greek philosopher Plato, who lived in 300 BC. Plato speaks of Atlantis in two of his dialogues, called Timaeus and Critias. All other later mentions of Atlantis are based on these two works. The dialogues claim to quote Solon, who was an Athenian statesman, constitutional lawmaker and poet, who visited Egypt between 590 and 580 BC. The dialogue states that Solon would translate Egyptian records of Atlantis. It's in Timaeus, written in 360 BC, that the island of Atlantis is first introduced. In the Timaeus, a discussion about Socrates' ideal state occurs in the Republic the day after he presented it. Socrates' ideal state was based on the concept of justice. In his ideal state, each person would fulfill the role they are best suited for with everyone working together for the good of the community. In the text, Socrates asks if anyone has an account for such an ideal state. That's when a general called Hermocrates mentions that Critias, one of Socrates' students, may know the perfect example of such a state. Critias then says that throughout history there have been many destructions of mankind, and the greatest have been brought about by the forces of nature. He then proceeds to tell the story of Solon's journey to Egypt, which is where he first heard the story of Atlantis. Critias says that Athens used to be an ideal state that waged war against Atlantis. He states that this tale may be strange, but it is true, as it was attested by Solon. According to Critias, Solon was a relative and a friend of his great-grandfather, and it was to him that Solon first told this story. This story is an ancient story of the accomplishments of Athens. Accomplishments that have since passed into oblivion through the passage of time, because these events took place 9,000 years ago. When Solon was visiting a city called Sais and speaking to the priests there, he would be told the story of Atlantis, an island that was situated in front of the Pillars of Hercules, which today is known as the Straits of Gibraltar. Atlantis was an island larger than Libya and Asia put together, an island that was home to a great and wonderful empire which ruled over both the kingdom of Atlantis as well as over parts of the continent. But for all their power, they still sought to rule over all lands. So the Atlanteans soon set their sights on Athens. While all others fell, Athens stood alone against the Atlanteans, and in the end, Athens was victorious. Sometime later, Atlantis would be shaken by violent earthquakes and floods. In a single day and night, the entire island would sink into the sea, never to be seen again. The more detailed history of Atlantis is then postponed 
to the dialogue called Critias, where Plato describes the island in more detail. In the text Critias, the earth was divided among the gods in ancient times. The areas that now are the islands of Greece were high hills covered in good soil before the gods divided them between themselves. The island that would be known as Atlantis was allotted to Poseidon, god of the seas and oceans. Poseidon had five sets of twins with a mortal woman named Clato. The firstborn was named Atlas, who inherited the kingdom of Atlantis. And for generations, the descendants of Atlas would in turn inherit the kingdom. The island of Atlantis was a mountainous island rising straight from the sea with fertile central plains. Its land was rich with resources and produced trees, metals and abundant food. Many creatures, such as elephants, inhabited the island. The cities of the island were built with harbors and fine temples, with a temple to Poseidon at the center of the city. And this temple was constructed out of silver with a roof of ivory. The temple was surrounded by a wall of pure gold and decorated with golden statues. There were also fountains of hot and cold water, bathhouses, gymnasiums and even a horse racing track. Atlantis was heavily populated. The Atlanteans lived well with domesticated animals and fields rich with crops. The central hill of the island was surrounded by rings of sea with bridges and canals that had walls and gates constructed to join them. The island was also rich with a metal known as orichalcum, which is mentioned in several ancient writings. Orichalcum is first mentioned in the 7th century BC by Hesiod. Orichalcum was a metal used in coins during ancient times, and according to Plato, orichalcum was only second in value to gold. The inner wall that surrounded the citadel of Atlantis flashed with the red light of orichalcum. And the interior walls, pillars and floors of the Temple of Poseidon were completely covered in orichalcum, with the roof a mix of gold, silver and orichalcum. In the center of the main temple stood a pillar on which the laws of Poseidon and records of the first sun princes of Poseidon were inscribed. This pillar was also made entirely of orichalcum. The people of Atlantis were very religious, and one of their practices involved the chasing and sacrifice of bulls to their gods, most notably Poseidon. Atlantis also had quite the military might. They had a huge fleet of warships and an army that could field a force of 10,000 chariots. The civilization of Atlantis was said to be the most technologically advanced, powerful and prosperous that the world had ever seen. But according to Plato, despite having all of that, it wasn't enough for them. For all their power and wealth, the Atlanteans still wanted more. They were, quote, filled with an unjust lust for possessions and power. It's that lust for more wealth and more power that led them to declare war on all the peoples of the Mediterranean. Wars that they were more than capable of fighting due to the strength of their military. They would conquer and enslave most of their neighboring nations. And these continued victories made them want to expand ever outward. They wanted more and more and more. Soon, they set their sights on Athens, but they would underestimate the strength of Athens. When the Atlanteans attacked Athens, they were met with a strong resistance. So strong, in fact, that they chose to retreat, but only temporarily. The Atlanteans hadn't given up yet. This continued hubris by the people of Atlantis eventually caused them to fall out of the gods' favor. Angry with how morally bankrupt the Atlanteans became, the gods and Zeus made the decision to punish them. The Critias text then ends rather abruptly with Zeus gathering all the gods together. Atlantis' fate was sealed.
The gods would then send fire, floods, and earthquakes to the island. In just one night, Atlantis would be destroyed by these earthquakes and floods. By morning, the entire island of Atlantis had vanished. This island that was once seen as a beacon of culture and civilization, then horrible conquerors, were now gone, completely swallowed by the sea, never to be seen again. Ever since Plato wrote about Atlantis, there has been debates about what exactly he was referring to. Was he referring to a real place that once existed that has been lost to time? Or was he, as the philosopher he was, speaking more metaphorical, using this story as an example of the ideas that he wanted to put forth? While imagining Atlantis as a real place that once existed might be the more interesting part of this myth, let's start by looking at the more philosophical interpretations of Atlantis. The philosophy of Plato has had a large impact on Western religion, law, political theory, education, mathematics and, of course, philosophy. Some of his ideas include the nature of moral virtue and theories of the best form of government. The way Plato presented his ideas was by portraying conversations between two or more people, in which he could present various ideas, arguments and even counter-arguments. Most often one of the characters in his works was Socrates, who was Plato's teacher and mentor. Socrates was a prominent and influential figure in ancient Greece, but he left no written works behind. We'll get back to that. Another Greek philosopher, Aristotle, who was a student of Plato, believed that Plato invented the island of Atlantis as a way of teaching philosophy. The ideas of divine versus human nature ideal societies and the gradual corruption of human society are found in many of Plato's works. His writings hold a lot of truth about the human condition. It's been theorized by many people that Plato created the story of Atlantis to convey some of his own philosophical theories, meaning that the island itself never existed beyond his works. This interpretation can be backed up by how the tale of Atlantis plays out. The people of Atlantis had pretty much everything one could ever ask for, but they became greedy, petty, and morally bankrupt. So much so that it would anger the gods enough that they decided to step in and punish them. So one interpretation here could be that Greed for wealth and power only brings destruction. Another interpretation of the story of Atlantis is that it's a metaphor. A way to showcase the great city of Athens and how its people with their rule of law were able to defend against an aggressive foreign power. This interpretation also makes some sense when you're looking at the text because that's literally the motivation that the character Critias gives for telling the story of Atlantis. That the defeat of Atlantis by Athens was one of Athens' greatest achievements that have simply been forgotten over time. A story deserving to be told. And in Timaeus, there's a line about how Athens was forced to stand alone facing the invaders from Atlantis. Many have interpreted this as a reference to the Battle of Marathon, where the Greeks defended the invading Persian army of Darius. The Spartans were not present at Marathon, which left the Greeks standing alone against the foreign invaders. There's also the interpretation that the legend of Atlantis is based on some moment in history or that Plato could have been using bits of history to give the story a more solid place in the real world. One example of this is that the Atlanteans chased and sacrificed bulls, which is something that is known to have occurred on Crete during the time of the Minoans. The Minoans were familiar to Plato. There is a work called Minos about King Minos of Crete that is said to have been written by Plato. 
and this work admired King Minos for his lawmaking skills. But back to the idea of philosophy. A lot of people have argued that Plato wasn't a historian, he was a philosopher. One that is known to have used metaphors of various characters to express his own thoughts. Like I mentioned, one of these characters is Socrates, who left no written works of his own, but is often used in Plato's works which in turn makes it difficult to determine if the beliefs and ideas that are presented by Plato in his works are his own ideas, or if they were the ideas of Socrates. Because Socrates left no written works of his own, we have nothing to compare it to, so we can only speculate. The historical accuracy of Plato's works is a bit muddled. So much so that they were considered controversial even in ancient times. As you can imagine, all of these interpretations of Plato's work has led many people to conclude that Atlantis wasn't a real place. It was a story created by a philosopher to either convey some of his own philosophical theories or use as a metaphor to praise Athens. Again, Plato was known to have done this. For many people, something about the way Plato describes Atlantis is a bit too real to just be a fictional place. There's something about the details about both the world and the people and everything surrounding it that makes people feel like he must have been drawing inspiration from somewhere. This is a belief that has been held by numerous people throughout the centuries. Could Atlantis have been a real place? A real place that Plato used in the setting of his story. It's not an unheard of theory. There are plenty of examples of mythical places or beings that turn out to be very real. One such place is Troy. Like Atlantis, for the longest time, Troy was believed to merely be a fictional place and the setting for Homer's story. A myth. But the allure of Homer's story has led many to search for the lost city of Troy. For centuries it was believed that Troy was located in an area in the northwest corner of modern day Turkey. And as such, many people have gone in search of the city within that region. And many of them actually got very close to the location that today is considered to be the real location of the city of Troy. For instance, in the 16th and 17th centuries, travelers mistakenly identified Troy with Alexandria Troas, which is the site of an ancient Greek city that was situated on the Aegean Sea near the northern tip of Turkey's western coast. This area is known historically as the Troad. In the late 18th century, a French scholar named Jean-Baptiste Le Chevalier would identify another location as the city of Troy. And for a long time, that location was the most commonly proposed location for the lost city. In 1822, a Scottish journalist named Charles McLaren would identify the location of a site believed to be Troy. And the first excavations of this site were trenches by British civil engineer John Brunton in 1855. Another excavation to the site was conducted in 1865 by Frank Calvert. And he made extensive surveys of the site. He would also correctly identify it with classical era Ilion. Calvert's work is what convinced German businessman Heinrich Sleeman that this location was where they would find Troy. In 1868, Schliemann secured permission to continue excavating this site. Between the years 1871 to 1873, 1878 to 1879, 1882 and 1890, Sleeman would continue excavating this site. And this would prove successful, as he would discover the ruins of a series of ancient cities dating from the Bronze Age to the Roman period. This site is now known as the ancient city of Hisarlik, which is widely accepted as the site for Homer's tale, and is even listed in the UNESCO World Heritage List as the archaeological site of Troy. So what does that have to do with Atlantis? 
Well, if Troy was believed to be nothing but a myth until the city was actually found, does that mean that Atlantis could be hiding somewhere in the depth of the ocean? Many people do believe so. One of these people was writer Ignatius Donnelly, who in his 1882 book Atlantis the Antediluvian World argued that Atlantis was not a fable created by Plato. Instead, Donnelly wrote that the region where Atlantis resided was where civilization first emerged. And that wasn't the only theory about Atlantis that he put forth in his book. He also wrote that Egypt was most likely the oldest colony of Atlantis, that the original religion of Atlantis was sun worship, which were then adapted by countries like Peru and Egypt that all the gods and goddesses of the ancient Greeks, Hindus or the Norse were simply kings, queens and heroes of Atlantis. That many of the religions and mythologies that we see today all have their roots in Atlantis. Donnelly also believed that Atlantis did really perish in a natural disaster that caused the whole island to sink into the ocean with nearly all of its inhabitants. But he also theorized that some could have survived by escaping in ships and on rafts. To summarize, Donnelly argued that Atlantis was the root of everything, which you might want to take with a grain of salt. But despite that, Donnelly is credited as the one who revived the Atlantis myth. And many of the theories from his book acts as the main source for many modern-day interpretations about Atlantis. For instance, there's the Netflix show Ancient Apocalypse, which presents the idea that a once sophisticated culture was destroyed by floods triggered by a giant comet which crashed on Earth, and that this was the inspiration for the legend of Atlantis. And that, while the floods were devastating to this civilization, there were some that survived, and these survivors would then spread around the world, bringing with them their knowledge of science, technology, agriculture, and monumental architecture. Basically, this show is a modern take on the same ideas that was presented by Donnelly more than a century ago. I should point out though that these ideas about Atlantis have been dismissed by archaeologists who have argued that this is flawed thinking, if not outright rubbish. But if we entertain the idea that Atlantis was a real place, where was it? Plato's descriptions of Atlantis can be matched to numerous places around the world, and it's a long list. You could close your eyes, point somewhere on a map, and someone, somewhere, will have claimed that that's where you can find Atlantis. Obviously, because it's a long list, we won't be able to look at all of them in this video, but we can look at a few of the more interesting ones. The island of Santorini was once known as Thera, and home to a Bronze Age settlement near Akrotiri, which was discovered in 1964. This settlement is believed to be associated with the Minoan civilization that was located on the nearby island of Crete. The name Minoan derives from Minos, the mythical king of Crete who built the labyrinth that was the home or prison of the Minotaur. The Minoan civilization flourished in the Bronze Age between 2700 and 1600 BC on the island of Crete and smaller islands in the vicinity of Crete, like the island of Thera. The Minoans are believed to be Europe's first great civilization that helped shape the early Greek civilization. Greek historian Thucydides credited the Minoans as the first Talassocracy meaning dominion over the seas either through exploration, trade or colonization. The influence of the Minoans reached the whole Mediterranean Sea, including the Cyclades, Egypt, Cyprus, Canaan and Anatolia. The Minoan cities were advanced with roads, water and sewage facilities through pipes. One of the clearest signs of Minoan influence was its writing system, that would appear in the languages of later cultures. 
One of the oldest of these is known as Linear A. This language is yet to be deciphered, but it's believed that this is the local language of Minoan Crete. Linear A has been found inscribed on many of the clay vessels discovered on the islands across the Aegean Sea. The oldest known Greek dialect is called Linear B, which is derived from Linear A. But unlike Linear A, Linear B was deciphered in 1952. Back to Thera and Akrotiri. One of the best preserved Minoan settlements, Akrotiri, was a small, simple fishing and farming village during the 5th millennium BC. But that would change over time and the settlement would grow from its humble beginnings of a fishing village to a massive settlement with paved streets, an extensive drainage system, production of high-quality pottery and further craft specialization. Akrotiri would emerge as an important and wealthy trading city of the Bronze Age. This was largely due to trade relations that it established with other cultures in the Aegean. The strategic geographical location of Akrotiri, which was on the primary sailing route between Cyprus and Minoan Crete, also made the settlement an important point for the copper trade. The prosperity of this city would continue for about 500 years until it came to an end in the 16th century BC. This abrupt end was brought about by a massive earthquake that triggered one of the most destructive volcanic explosions in recorded history. The Santorini or Thera that we see today is very different from the Thera of the time of Akrotiri. The explosion was devastating, the equivalent of 40 atomic bombs or approximately 100 times more powerful than the later eruption of Pompeii. It killed upwards of 40,000 people in just a few hours. It produced colossal tsunamis. It spewed volcanic ash as far as Asia. It even caused a drop in global temperatures. The city of Akrotiri was completely buried under ash, which preserved the ruins and is also the reason why Akrotiri is sometimes called the Minoan Pompeii. But unlike Pompeii, there are no human remains found in Akrotiri. And because of this, there are some theories that suggest that the Minoan residents of Santorini may have predicted the eruption and quickly evacuated the island. But while the residents living on the island may have been able to flee the explosion and its devastating effect, it still served as the beginning of the end for the Minoan civilization. Soon after the explosion, the decline of the Minoans would begin. The tsunamis that were caused by the explosion would have swamped the naval fleets and coastal villages. The drop in temperatures would have led to several years of cold, wet summers in the region, which in turn would ruin harvests. The eruption also damaged other cities along the Minoan trade routes, which would hurt Crete economically. As far as we know, Crete was not directly affected by the eruption, as no damage from the eruption has been found on the island, but it's very clear that they suffered from this explosion. It is important to note, however, that the volcano erupting was not the only thing causing the decline of the Minoans. Evidence has been uncovered of an invasion in the mid-15th century BC. This invasion led to many sites being burned and many settlements being abandoned. And it's very likely that these invaders, whoever they were, overthrew the weakened Minoan government took control of the island and thus ending the era of Crete as a dominant force. The city of Akrotiri, its Minoan connection and the devastating event that marked the beginning of its decline is believed by many to at the very least have been Plato's inspiration for Atlantis. Plato wrote about Atlantis over a thousand years after the explosion of Santorini. Humans have always been drawn to stories, and it's very likely that tales about Akrotiri and the island of Thera was passed down in Greece over many generations, 
and as such, it's very possible that the tale is one that Plato may have been very familiar with, and then used as his inspiration when he told the tale of Atlantis. Some argued against the idea that Thera was the inspiration for Atlantis. The main argument here is that the time of the Minoan eruption doesn't exactly match with when Plato said Atlantis was destroyed. The counter argument to that is if we argue that the Minoan eruption was merely Plato's inspiration for his work, then the time doesn't matter. Because Plato was not writing a historical account of the island of Thera. He was writing the tale of a fictional island called Atlantis while using Thera as an inspiration. At least that's how this theory goes. Thera isn't the only proposed location for Atlantis. There are other places which have been suggested as possible locations for this island all over the world. One such is Andalusia. Andalusia is located in the south of the Iberian Peninsula in southwestern Europe. The area is home to the city of Tartessos. The Tartessian culture thrived in the Iberian Peninsula of southern Spain before vanishing from historical records around 2,500 years ago. Tartessos is referred to in both Greek and Roman texts, but the descriptions were conflicting. For instance, Aristotle refers to Tartessos as a river while geographer Pausanias writes that Tartessus is a river that shares its name with a city. And these conflicting records have made it very difficult for historians to pinpoint just what Tartessus actually was. Was it a city, a river, or a kingdom? Because of these conflicting accounts, it's also been speculated that Tartessus could have been the real place of another mythical civilization or a city. For instance, Tartessos is often linked with the city mentioned in the Bible as Tarshish, where Jonah tried to flee before the whale swallowed him. And, of course, Tartessos is also been speculated to have been the inspiration for Atlantis. Which also means that the biblical tale of Tarshish could have been Atlantis if you believe that these two are one and the same. For one, the location matches. Tarsessos was described by writers like Herodotus to be beyond the Pillars of Hercules. And where was Atlantis located according to Plato? Beyond the Pillars of Hercules. Tarsessos is also believed to have been an advanced society which may have been lost beneath the waves. Some have even gone as far as theorizing that Tarsessos could have been a contemporary of Atlantis. The idea that Tartessos may have been Atlantis is not a new one. In fact, it dates back to the 16th century. Spanish author Juan de Mariana and Dutch author Johannes van Gorp both suggested that the metropolis of Atlantis was between the islands Mayor and Menor, which are located almost in the center of the Donana marshes. These claims would then be repeated in the 20th century as well as the 21st century by various authors. The general consensus is that if you're looking for Atlantis, you will find it somewhere in Andalusia. In 2018, satellite imagery was used to examine ancient ruins north of the city of Cadiz, Andalusia, which is centered around the Donana National Park. Like Hisarlik, this area is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's been found that the Donana National Park experienced intense erosion from 4000 BC before it became a marine environment in the 9th century AD. It is believed that this area may have been home to various civilizations, including the Tartessians and possibly the Atlanteans. Another proposed location for Atlantis is at the bottom of the eastern Mediterranean within the Cyprus Basin. According to an American architect, Robert Sarmast, images from sonar data of the sea bottom of the Cyprus Basin show features that resemble man-made structures at depths of 1,500 meters, and theorizes that these structures may have been part of the lost city of Atlantis. There is evidence that the Mediterranean Sea dried up during an event called the Messinian Salinity Crisis. 
The Mycenaean salinity crisis, or the Mycenaean event, was a geological event where the Mediterranean Sea dried up for an extensive period of time millions of years ago. This was caused by reduced water inflow from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mediterranean Sea. This led to the previously submerged ocean bottom turning into a desert, meaning that the Mediterranean Sea was once a desert. The Mycenaean salinity crisis would end when the Strait of Gibraltar reopened again, causing the Mediterranean basin to be flooded by the Atlantic in an event that is known as the Saclian Flood. Sarmas argues that this entire event, the Straits of Gibraltar closing leading to the drying up of the Mediterranean Sea, as well as the flooding when the Straits reopen again, has happened many times. And that what happened to Atlantis may have been one of those times. However, there's been some pushback against this theory. Archaeologists and marine geologists who have studied the bottom of the Cyprus Basin disagree with this interpretation. Research has been conducted on the features that Sarmast interpreted as Atlantis. According to this research, these features consist only of a natural compressional fold, which is caused by local salt tectonics, that they are natural tectonic landforms. Further research have also shown that the entire Cyprus basin, including the ridge where Sarmas claimed that Atlantis was located, has been submerged beneath the Mediterranean Sea for millions of years, making it unlikely to have been Atlantis. The final location we'll be looking at in this video is Antarctica. Antarctica is a favorite location for various theories, which covers everything from aliens to ancient civilizations, such as Atlantis. The idea that Atlantis could be found in this region is a relatively new one, dating back to the mid-20th century. In his 1958 book called Earth's Shifting Crust, Charles Hapgood proposed a theory that Antarctica could be where Atlantis would be found. The theory being that due to the shifting of the Earth's crust, the island of Atlantis was displaced. This theory is called crust displacement. Another factor in the theory that Atlantis could be found in Antarctica is the map made by the Ottoman admiral Piri Reis in 1513. This map appears to show the Antarctic coast hundreds of years before the discovery of the Antarctic continent, which was in 1820. The map also supposedly shows Antarctica as ice-free which might suggest that an ancient civilization existed on that continent. Though, regarding the Piri Reis map, some have argued that the map is showing Argentina and not Antarctica. For some, the idea that Atlantis could be found in the Arctic was given some credence when, in 2018, satellite images from NASA seemed to show a possible human settlement. These images seem to show markings in the snow that appeared manufactured, as if there were structures that used to stand there. And in 2020, researchers discovered what appeared to be underground constructions. Though many scientists have stated that these are most likely naturally occurring formations, and not man-made constructions. Scientists have also dismissed Hapgood's theory as pseudoscience, because it was based on data which is now known to be incorrect and incomplete. What I have always found fascinating about Atlantis is not just the story itself and the longevity that it has, but also what people tend to believe when it comes to Atlantis. From what I found when researching, three possibilities are the most common. One is that the story of Atlantis was a metaphor for a real event. Two is that it was a way for Plato to communicate his philosophical ideas. Or three, he was describing a real place. 
either a real island that was known as Atlantis or an island that inspired the story of Atlantis. I tend to believe that all three of those being true at the same time. Based on the text by Plato that we do have, he did all of those three things often. He used his dialogues to convey his own ideas, often through other characters who had dialogues and arguments with each other. And these characters were very much based on real people, such as Socrates talking about real events. So why wouldn't he take a real place that he had learned about, use that as the basis for an island that he called Atlantis, and then use that story as a vessel to either showcase the greatness of Athens and or to convey his own ideas? It's a pretty common thing in writing after all. Inspiration has to come from somewhere, and sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. For me, I think that Plato may have used a real place as inspiration for the fictional tale of Atlantis that he used to convey his own ideas and to showcase the greatness of Athens. The question then becomes, what place? Was it an island that suffered from a natural disaster, like Thera or Santorini? Was it a city like Tartessos, or a country that we have yet to learn about? Ancient civilizations have risen and fallen numerous times throughout history. It's difficult, if not impossible, to know exactly how many and who they were. Because the only ones that we know about are the ones who left something behind in some way, be it ruins, writings, or small artifacts. So it's very possible that this ancient civilization that Plato knew about and used as inspiration for Atlantis is one that we have never heard about, and one that we probably never will hear about unless we find something from them, or written about by other people. Socrates considered writing to be inferior to dialogue as a method of inquiry. As such, he left no written works of his own behind. And if it hadn't been for the writings of others, Socrates and his philosophies and ideas would have been lost to history. Of course, this also muddles the history of Socrates a bit because we don't really know if everything that's written about him really was his ideas, theories or philosophies. Which is also a debate regarding Plato's works. Was it his ideas or was he conveying the ideas of his teacher? I believe that Plato did use the story as a metaphor, he did use it as a way to convey his philosophical ideas, and he was writing about a real place. Obviously that's not the most exciting conclusion. Atlantis being based on a real place that Plato took some liberties with when he told the story is less exciting than the idea that it's a real place that Plato described a technologically advanced civilization that vanished when their island sunk into the sea. I believe that question is part of what has captured the imagination of people throughout the centuries, and I'd be lying if I said that the idea of the Atlantis that Plato described being an actual place wasn't a very exciting thought. That would be amazing if it turned out that Atlantis was actually real. But I do have my doubts. I'm leaning more towards it being a place that Plato knew about that maybe we didn't necessarily know about, or if it is a place that we do know about, I tend to lean towards Thera or Andalusia. To me, these two locations feel like the most likely possible location for the mythical Atlantis. And even if Plato was describing a civilization that we still don't know about, people won't stop searching, for the simple reason that humans are curious creatures. It is and has been the driving force behind our development, both as individuals and as a species. There is also the fact that the ocean is still largely unexplored. For instance, there are many famous shipwrecks that still haven't been found. And there are structures in the oceans that have sparked debate on whether or not it's man-made or natural. 
One such is the Yonaguni Monument, which has fascinated divers and geologists ever since it was first discovered in 1987. And this monument has even been given the nickname Japan's Atlantis. So if there's one thing we know for certain, it is that the ocean keeps her secrets. And who's to say that Atlantis isn't one of them? So for me, Atlantis was a real place, but not in the sense that the entire island existed. Rather, it was simply a real place that was the inspiration for Plato. 